Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, Wine Society members, to our first uh, exclusive tasting uh, over this platform. So I'm excited to do this. Uh, we uh, One of the things that we look forward to doing more with, with our uh, Wine Society members is this type of thing where we can connect with you and uh, taste the wines with you before anybody else gets the chance to do it. So we, we have quite a few wines to taste today. Uh, we looked into our library to see what wines could be interesting to, to offer to people while they're uh, sheltering in place at home. And uh, believe it or not, I had to go through and taste several wines to figure out the ones that I thought were worthy of releasing right now. So basically what the uh, library is about is we decide every year, you know, we have a production, we have a bottling run, and we're going to hold, we hold back a certain quantity of wines for the library. One, because it's important for us to see how it's going to age, but also, you know, to share it with people so they can also see how it's going to age. So basically we have two different libraries. We have the, the winemakers library where we're, we're going to try to keep as many uh, wines, you know, maybe a case of each into the future as we want. And then this, this library aspect that we look forward to sharing with, with people because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to check in on wine, especially that it's wine that's designed to, to age to see how it's changing over time. So, again, welcome. Uh, one of the other things, too, is this uh, hopefully will be an interactive session. So please send in your questions. And once I get towards the end of my uh, presentation of the wines, I'm going to look on my phone and see whatever questions you texted in or uh, typed in. I have uh, my handy assistant's going to text them to me so that I can read them off and hopefully answer them the best that I can. So we have basically, uh, we have exactly, not basically, five wines here, all red. And these all co come from Carnero. So it's a pretty interesting tasting in that uh, you're going to see two wines, the same varietal, two different vintages, consecutive vintages. And uh, even the, and then you're going to see three other varietals. So we have a Pinot Noir, two Cabernet Francs, a Merlot, and a red wine blend that I'll tell you more about when we get to that, which is I'm really excited to taste. And basically, it's it's pretty interesting in that, you know, you get to see the same varietal over two vintages from the same vineyard, but you also get to see what happens in that same vineyard uh, with different varietals that are grown there as well. So this vineyard is in Carneros. It's in the, it's uh, called the Hyde Vineyard. And Carneros uh, is in the south part of the Napa Valley. So it's the southernmost sub-appellation of the Napa Valley. And uh, interestingly enough, Carneros is not only in Napa, but it's also in Sonoma. So we work exclusively on the Napa side, and that's where this Hyde Vineyard is located. And the Carneros uh, area is uh, closest to the San Francisco Bay, which around here is called the San Pablo Bay. And uh, it's, it's known uh, because it's the coolest part of the Napa Valley. And cool, by cool, I mean weather. It's also a cool place to check out, but by cool here, I mean weather. And it's quite uh, cooler down there than it is even where we are in Yountville, where the winery is. Uh, as, uh, it's, it's about a 15, 20 minute drive if you, if you catch the traffic lights right. So it's not very far, but there could be as much as a 10, 15 degree temperature difference during the heat of summer. So it's pretty interesting that, you know, some, some place that's that close has such a different temperature and, and the soils are a little bit different down there. Uh, pretty consistent soils. I'm, my screen's trying to go dark on me here. Pretty consistent soils. And so it's interesting to see, you know, these different varietals that I keep saying planted on the, basically the same soil in the Carneros area. And what's remarkable is that you can grow uh, these different wines that uh, typically you'd have to go a pretty long distance in, in France where these varietals originate from to catch the different varietals. And here it's just a matter of a, you know, driving my truck a couple minutes between the different blocks to check them out. So pretty interesting in that regard. So without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and taste uh, the first wine. So I set these up, you know, one of the things that I thought about besides uh, which wines I wanted to offer for this library tasting is also the sequence of tasting for this, you know, because normally you know, this this is exactly how uh, my work day is sometimes is I have a bunch of glasses of wine in front of me that I need to taste. And so what's important for me as the winemaker is to be able to uh, set it up in a way that my palate can just kind of go from one wine to the next without the shock of, you know, one wine being extremely fruity or one wine being extremely tannic. And just kind of have the progression. And that's basically how I set it up is by tannin. So I choose the, the varietal for the most part when I'm tasting. I taste the same varietal, you know, during the course of the tasting from the softest one to the toughest one. But in the case like this, where I'm tasting different varietals from different vintages, I try to do the same thing, but it might not necessarily be the sequence that I would taste if they were all the same vintage. So in this case, uh, we're tasting the first wine is a 2013 Pinot. 
And uh, people that know me know that uh, I love Pinot Noir. It's one of my favorite wines to drink or one of my favorite wines to make. And it's a, it's a very difficult wine to make. And uh, what, what's cool about this specific Pinot Noir is uh, it, that it's a single clone of Pinot. So um, for those of you that participated in the sip tasting on the Stanley Ranch Pinot, that Pinot is a blend of four different clones. And when you think about clones, just think about apples and how you have red apples, you have green apples, you got Fuji apples. They're all apples, but they all have kind of different characteristics. And we have the same thing with the different varieties of wine grapes. So what's remarkable about this wine is that it's a single clone and it's called Calera. It's not a very widely planted clone around here anyway. And, and a lot of the old vineyards have been replanted to more modern uh, uh, Burgundy clones like we have in the Stanley Ranch Pinot. And so what's interesting to me about this clone is instead of using uh, aspects of different clones to, to get to the final goal of uh, a perfect wine, this clone specifically has pretty much everything built into it. So. It's got really, a, it, it's, a, it's a tough clone to work with because it makes really small clusters. It grows really tiny clusters about this big. And on that cluster, we have what's called chicks and hens, which is uh, big berries and little berries. And so that makes it really difficult to gauge, one, how, much, uh, how, much, how many tons or you know, the volume of grapes that we have out there, but also to decide when we're going to harvest because that's uh, ultimately the, the, the most important decision for me is the harvesting of the grapes, when it's going to happen. And so when you have these two different sizes of berries, they have different characteristics. Some are sweeter, they have more sugar, some are less sweet, some are more tannic, some have more juice, less juice. And so it's a, it's a pretty rigorous uh, mental exercise to figure out when it's going to get harvested. So we harvest this, this comes into the winery, typically beginning of September. And uh, we, we go in an open top tank so that we can treat this like, like I like to treat Pinot's, which is with very little aeration. And... Uh, and try to draw out what my screen's trying to go dark on me again. Uh, try to draw out what the characteristics are of this clone. So this is a very powerful clone. It's got a lot of structure. It's got a lot of fruit elements, and that's why I feel that it makes a perfect wine on its own without having to blend other clones into it. So when we taste it, we see, you know, the the, the wine is still pretty young. It's a 2013, um, so it's uh, going on seven years now. You know. Um, but I'm still impressed by how fresh it is. It still has pretty lively nose, which is important for me across the board with my wines. And it smells of Pinot. It's got a really strong Pinot Noir characteristic. And what you'll see in the color, for those of you that uh, get the chance to taste this at home, is you'll see that the color is still really vibrant and that uh, um, we don't really have any signs of oxidation yet. So this, this vineyard produces a wine that's... Um, pretty high in, in acid, and that's something that I look for pretty much in all the grapes that I work with. And so that acidity combined with the alcohol allow the wine to maintain its freshness and to age a little bit longer than it would have had it had a lesser degree of acidity. So when you taste it and you smell it, you've got this really nice uh, blackberry, real fruity nose to it, kind of a soft, like a dark red cherry kind of nose. And it's just a beautiful aroma, just really easy to fall in love with, with the way it smells. So this wine, part of its characteristic, too, is it, it, is, is it goes into 100% new oak, and it ages for two years, 24 months, in 100% new barrels, which is, for a Pinot, that's quite a lot. Pinot being a pretty delicate varietal, there aren't too many Pinots out there that can handle that much oak. And so the, the goal, just with all of my wines, is not to give it an oaky character, but to bring something else to the mix of complexity that I'm trying to achieve in the wine. So when you taste the wine, when you smell it, you might get some uh, spice characters or, uh, or some kind of wood characters like a cedar and things like that that are more typical of the wood that I use that, that doesn't really smell or taste like butterscotch or vanilla, but have these other elements to it and mixed in with this really uh, dark cherry aroma that it has currently. It's, it's just a really, really attractive nose. Then when you go into the, the taste of it, It's still a very fresh wine. Still has plenty of acidity. The structure is there, but it's a little bit softer than it was when, when it was first released several years ago. And it's just drinking really, really nice. There's a lot of uh, residual aroma, re residual perfume on the palate. And it just lingers on for a really, really long time. So I'm really happy the way this wine is tasting. And I hope you you get the chance to enjoy this. It's a, quite, a, quite an interesting 
way to see Pinot Noir from Carneros. It's it's pretty unique and it's a very powerful wine. And, and a lot of the Pinots from Carneros tend to be a little bit on the lighter side and more on the strawberry side than this. And this is, it's a pretty serious Pinot Noir. So I hope you get the chance to enjoy that. So now I'm going to jump over, over to the Cabernet Francs. Let me just check my messages real quick in case somebody's trying to tell me something important. Okay. It's a question. That's good. So that means everything is coming through uh, loud and clear, which is great. So I'll get back to the question uh, towards the end. So now I'm going to jump to the Cabernet Francs. So two vintages. These are, again, from the Hyde Vineyard in Carneros. We have the first one is a 2012, and the second one is a 2014. And one of the things that I want to point out about uh, these wines that we have is, you know, I, I have a very natural approach to making wine, and I don't like to uh, manipulate the wines if I don't have to. So sometimes, you know, there's stuff in there that you want to take out, and you got to filter the wines because there, there, might be, there might be a microorganism in there that uh, will change or alter the flavor of your wine uh, as it ages in the bottle. And sometimes, you know, you have no choice but to filter that out. But I try to avoid that if I can. I, I try to do what's right. And in, on certain varietals, I can get away with it much more than I can with others. So usually, like on the Bordeaux varietals, I don't have any problems by the end of the, of the aging to uh, have a, a relatively clean wine to go into the bottle, which means that uh, it, it's clear and, and a lot of the stuff that settles out in the, in, in the barrel has settled out and I can pull it off that and, and bottle it clean. And also, I, I don't have as much of an issue with uh, any microorganisms altering the flavor of the wine once in the bottle. But... What will happen, and uh, you'll see if you're this 12 Cabernet Franc, is you might experience some sediment in the bottle. And so you see this filter that I have on here uh, is a pretty handy doohickey because I don't like to leave any wine in the bottle. I feel, I feel like, you know, if I paid for it, I want to drink it all. So a few years ago, I was able to find this thing. It's just kind of a filter that you put in put into the top of the bottle. It doesn't aerate or anything like that. It just filters out any sediment that the bottle may have. And this 2012, specifically, I'm looking for the cork so I can show you, has quite a bit of sediment. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very much. There's crystals and stuff on there, and I'll, I'll rub it on my finger, and you can see what I'm talking about. There's you know, quite a bit of stuff that settled, settled on the cork, and it also settles on the sides of the bottle sometimes, and all the way, of course, at the bottom of the bottle, depending on, on how you store it. So for me, it's important to, uh, even though that stuff doesn't really taste like anything it doesn't won't do you any harm if you taste it it's just you know when you pour it in the glass it's just kind of nicer to drink a clean glass of wine rather than one that's got sediment in it but i highly recommend getting these things they're very cheap you can get a couple of them i think for like six bucks on amazon but it's a really good investment one of the few things that i do like to recommend for people to enjoy their wine at home it's one of the very few gizmos that i would use anyway back to the wine so this is 2012 and uh this is not too far from where the Pinot that we that I tasted first is. So this is uh, more on the west side or the east side of the Hyde Vineyard. And the Hyde Vineyard is is a it's a long and narrow vineyard. It's it's about a couple miles long, but not that wide. And so as you go to the back of the property, it gets relatively you know a little bit significantly warmer. I'm not talking about 10 degrees or 15 degrees. I'm talking about a few degrees warmer towards the back, further away from the water than in the front, which is closer and cooler. And so on that vineyard on the front side, there's more cooler climate varietals, such as Chardonnay primarily. And then, then it starts transitioning to Pinot and Syrah. And as you go more to the back, you get more into the Bordeaux varietals. And so the 2012 version of the Cabernet Franc is a single clone of Cabernet Franc and a single uh, planting, a single block in the vineyard of Cabernet Franc that was about 30 years old at the time. And so it was planted on uh, basically what used, looks like a dry riverbed. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, river stone looking things that buried in the soil and the vines all had uh, a lot of them had virus and so the virus causes the leaves to turn red and it and it, once the leaves turn red they stop functioning so they're you know they're kind of antennas and once they're when they're green they're really absorbing all the sun and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing and when they're red they're not absorbing the sunlight anymore and they're, and they're not really doing any work so that what ends up happening is it's very difficult to get uh, a uh, a wine or grapes extremely ripe here, which I like, you know, it maintains a certain degree of ripeness on the grapes. And it also gives a little bit more uh, accent to the, the, the flavor profile of the wine, which with this uh, virus, you end up harvesting the grapes at about 14, 14 and a half percent alcohol. And uh, 
you, you maintain much more of this uh, with Cabernet Franc, I think it gives you much more of this classic kind of pencil lead, pencil shavings, uh, anise, things like that. Those, those kind of characters in the wine. So uh, one of the wines that I love to show people when they come here is this, this these two specific wines, the, the two versions of the Cab Franc, which I think a lot of people are surprised by. One, because uh, they're not used to drinking a pure Cabernet Franc. Most people use Cabernet Franc in a blend with Cabernet Sauvignon. And I've done that in the past, too, and it has a really nice way of just complementing Cabernet Sauvignon, just completing the Cabernet Sauvignon blend to give it all it needs. So, But in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a rare opportunity to taste an, an old Cabernet Franc and 100% Cabernet Franc. So on this wine, being a little bit more delicate in nature, I don't, I don't use a lot of new oaks. I use about 50% new oaks on this specific vintage with the older um, uh, clone that was planted in there, 30-year-old clone. And so... I'm, with the new barrel, you tend to overwhelm the wine if it, if, if, because it's so delicate at this point. So I, I use only 50% new oak with the same goal as, as I had with the Pinot, which is to bring in a little bit more complexity to the wine. But again, not to have a pure oak character in the wine. You know, I really want to showcase uh, the aromas, which being in a cool place, you really retain much more of the aromatics and the acidity you know, of the wine being in a cool place, you retain much more of that compared to when you go up Valley on the Cap France, your acidity basically, you know, goes down by a couple points. So, so let's taste this. And it's just got a beautiful aroma. It's got a very captivating nose. I'm um, just like the Pinot and, and in this case, even more so to 2012. I'm uh, really impressed by all that it has to offer in the nose. I mean, it really draws you in just the classic aromas of Cabernet Franc. Um, you know, what's tough about Cabernet Franc is it could, it could be vegetal and grassy and things like that if it doesn't get ripe or, or even if you have the, the sugar that you need to convert to the alcohol that you want, sometimes you don't get rid of those green characters that are kind of bell pepper or, or like I said, grassy. And uh, the, the sunshine really helps burn all that away. So one of the concerns when you're making this wine and when you're growing the grapes is waiting for that to go away because that just typically what that leads to you having to wait much longer in the bottle to enjoy the wine for that for those herbal characters that just kind of start transforming in the bottle into something that's a lot more pleasurable than uh, you know stems and, and bell peppers and things like that so so you smell it it's got a very intense nose it doesn't punch you in the face but it's definitely there and it draws you in and it's just a beautiful smell to me again with the color uh, it's an aged wine from 2012 you'll see that it's a, it's a fresh looking wine still. There's no browning on the rim or it doesn't have a brick color or anything like that. So uh, it hasn't quite gone into an, uh, an oxidized uh, stage yet. And then when we taste it, it's a very, very lovely wine, I guess is the best way to say it. It's, it's so, um, Noble, I guess, is the word that I'm that I would use to describe this wine. It, it it's mellowed out enough with its tannin, and uh, Cabernet Franc can have a lot of astringency when it's young. That's kind of mellowed out. It's still there, but it, just like the aroma, it doesn't punch you in the face with just a bunch of tannin. It doesn't dry out your mouth at all. But it's just tasting beautifully still. And um, I would expect this, along with the Pinot, to continue to go for for another ten years easily. But uh, if you're lucky enough to get some of this wine, we're only offering 10 cases of this is all we can uh, afford to release from our library. It's going to be hard for you not to drink it soon because it's so tasty. I mean, it really is. Uh, and then to compare it with the 2013 version. And now the, the difference in the 13 is that uh, the family asked me to trial a clone. The, the grower of this asked me to trial a different clone because they wanted to replant the clone that was in, used for the 2012 version. And so, uh, you know, they, they like to experiment with different roads and stuff before they actually commit to what they're going to, which, which one they're going to use for the actual planting. And so uh, they planted four rows of this uh, new clone for, from Bordeaux. And uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, the requirements in Bordeaux are a little bit different than what they are here in Napa in terms of uh, what, what you're looking for in how you grow the grapes. They have much different weather than we do. They have rainier weather and it's much difficult for the, during the growing season and it's much difficult, more difficult for them to achieve perfect ripeness in the grapes. And by what I mean by perfect ripeness in the case of Cabernet Franc is getting away from those green vegetal characters that I was describing earlier. 
not not having an excessive amount of sugar that turns into alcohol, but just getting away from those cream flavors and just having the fruit character that's more typical of the varietal when it's ripe. And so for them, they're looking for clones because their rainy season is basically all, you know, it rains in the summer and it rains when they harvest. And as you get deeper into the year in Bordeaux, the chances of it raining are get much higher. So if they're harvesting this late September, early October, you know, that's pretty much when the rainy season is, is uh, really starting in, in, in that area. Compared to us, it doesn't really rain here until late October, early November for the most part, right? So we have a much easier time getting to ripeness. So what does that mean then? Is this new clone then that the, they're investigating will ripen sooner and have a higher degree of fruit character to it, much more so than maybe these typical Cabernet Franc character, characteristics that we saw in the 12. So in the 13, we have a pretty much a 50-50 blend of this old clone, because it's, it's called the Knee Bomb clone, because it was originally planted at, at uh, uh, Coppola's winery here that originally was owned by Gustave Knee Bomb. And so somebody brought this clone over from France and planted it there, and, and here in California, just retained the name Knee Bomb for the clone. And so in modern times, then the clone that we have here is called 214, so not quite a sexy name. It's uh, People have gotten boring with how they name their clones. So the number doesn't really tell you anything. It's just when you look it up in a catalog, that's the clone, 214. And uh, so this clone is designed then to ripen a little bit sooner and faster to uh, acclimate to the, the conditions that they have in Bordeaux, which it, for Carneros, I think it, it works really well because it being a cooler area, it doesn't require the hang time that, that uh, it would, if it was a different clone that, that requires longer hang time, that maybe we would select to plant up valley where it's warmer. And so we would shorten the hang time there by tr with, with, with the more heat that we have, it would allow us to shorten the, the hang time. So it's basically a 50-50 clone. And uh, originally this 13 took a little while to uh, come together in the glass for me. You know, I, I maintained both of the uh, different clones separate in the barrel and I combined the two right when we bottled. And so usually what that means is uh, when, when you wait so long to put the stuff together, it takes a little bit of time for it to come together in, in the glass. So when I was, when this wine was first released, one day I'd, I'd get the, the new clone and another day I'd get the old clone and it just took a while for it to all come together and really show what it is as a single piece. So I was really happy with the way this turned out. And for the longest time, the 12 was my favorite and the one that I bragged about when people came to the winery to, to visit, that's the one that I was, I would always pull out at the end for people to see. And then one day I ran out of the 12 in the winery and I said, okay, well, let's try the 13. And I was astonished at how good the 13 was tasting. I mean, I was really surprised. I had kind of this notion that because of this younger clone that was in there mixed with the older clone, that it was just going to take a lot longer for it to, to really be ready. And so that became my favorite for a little while. So let's yeah, let's see how it's tasting. We tasted these last week just to make sure that th this was the lineup that we wanted to offer for, uh, uh, for the library portfolio that we're releasing. And this also, we're doing just, just 10 cases. The Cabernet Franc tends to go pretty fast here. So we can only afford to let go 10 cases. And then we're just down to my uh, my winemaker reserve. So so again, when you smell it, it's a pretty, it's it's got characteristics of the 12, but it's got other characteristics, characteristics as well. So it's a little bit more intense than the 12. It's a year younger, but also I think the newer fruit tends to really uh, last longer. So you get more of the fruit character in this wine in the nose anyway. And you get more dark red fruits and plums and things like that in the nose. And you have in the background a little bit of uh, what we call this classic Cabernet front character, which is the, the pencil shadings that I was talking about earlier on the 12. And so I think the, the aromas actually carry through into the taste of the wine. So if you get the two and you compare the two, you find that the, the 13 is just much more fleshy than the 12. The 12, it's a little bit leaner. It's a little bit older, you know, more fragile. Uh, if, I, if I was to use like people comparisons, you know, it, it, it feels like an older person, but it's very noble. And the 12 just seems like it's a younger person. It's got more, more meat on the bones. It's more fleshy. It maybe just requires a little bit more time in the bottle to mellow out. But if you like young fruity wines, this is definitely tasting pretty, pretty good right now. More than pretty good. So it's pretty delicious, pretty tasty wine. So hopefully you get the chance to taste that. So I'm going to move these over a little bit. 
And we're going to go over to the Merlot. And I don't think you can see on here, but you, on the top of the bottle, you see some sediment right up here. I don't think you can see it, but anyway, there it is. And that's kind of what I was talking about with the first cow frog. You know, when the bottles start to age and this uh, non-filtration approach to some of these wines, you know, you're going to get some of that in, 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 in the wine. And it's just a sign that we're doing everything as, as naturally as we can when you see that kind of stuff in there. And, you know, that's the vintage dependent. Some vintages will throw a lot. Some vintages won't throw any. So, you know, in the case of the 14, there was plenty of material in here and it just, you know, started uh, doing this in the course of aging. So, anyway, it's the 14 Cap Franc. And uh, it's a pretty unique, I'm sorry, it's a Merlot. It's a pretty unique Merlot. Um, a little bit more difficult to ripen Merlots and Cabernet Sauvignons and Carneros. Uh, they tend to have a, a pretty high degree of pyrazines, which is this bell pepper type character that's... Uh, is not as easy to uh, to uh, overcome as it is in Cabernet Franc. So you really need a lot of hang time. And typically the Merlot, you know, when we start the harvest, we start with the Pinot, the first wine that we tasted back early September. And the Merlot is actually the last thing we harvest. So we go up valley, we do all of our Cabernet harvest up valley in, in Rutherford and then in Yountville and Oakville and then uh, Stag's Leap. And then we finish the Cabernet, and then we go back to Carneros to, to pick the Merlot. And it's usually the last one that comes in somewhere towards the middle or end of October. And it just needs a lot of hang time to really burn off those green characters. So this wine also, uh, in order to respect the fruit, it's about 50% new, new French oak. All of these wines so far, with the exception of the Pinot Noir that we tasted originally, are 18 months. That one was 24 months in oak. And 18 months is about the right amount of time for this. After that, you start pulling more of these creme brulee characters out of the barrel that I really don't want to put into the wine. So at, at about 18 months on these Cap Francs and Merlots, it seems to be the right amount of aging to have the complexity from the oak, but not start bringing in some of these other characteristics that I think are more uh, uh, candy tasting than they are wine tasting. So, you know, when the, these wines that we're showing today as well, all of the production when we first uh, released it, it was a really small production. This is 300 cases of the, of the Merlot. The 2012 Cap Franc was only 150 cases. The 13 was also 150 cases, and the Pinot Noir was 250. So we're talking about really small amounts of wine that we make here. And uh, what's important to point out is that is uh, governed by the size of the vineyard. It has nothing to do with uh, how much we want to bottle. It's the actual vineyard that's producing only that amount of wine. So, you know, a 300 case production of Merlot on uh, this property, you know, with the size of the acres that they have, that's a really small amount of Merlot. It's, um, it, it just goes to show, you know, the, the dedication to quality when a grower is willing to only produce so many grapes so that they guarantee that the winemakers are going to be happy and make a really, really delicious wine. So anyway, back to the Merlot. And when you smell it, it the reason I selected this wine, and it's a, you know, a newer vintage, more or less, it's 2014. I think it's just tasting so spectacular right now. I mean, when I smell it, I get these really world-class aromas that I find in some of the top Merlots in the world. And one of the top of the Merlots in the world is the Masetto that I made in, in Tuscany back in 2001, which uh, the critics loved it and they called, they gave it 100 points and they said it was the, the best Tuscan wine or Italian wine ever produced. And they haven't said that there's a new one since. And this reminds me a lot, the aromatics of it reminds me a lot of this Masetto that was produced in Tuscany. And so the, the growing conditions for this too, you know, I keep mentioning this is down in Carneros. It's, it's a little, it takes a little bit longer for ripeness to happen, but it also retains plenty of acidity. And so I, I still think it has plenty of uh, aging power, aging potential, but I wanted to release this now again um, because it's tasting so good right now. I mean, I'm so impressed with this wine. And so after having worked in Tuscany and I came back from Italy, there was really no Merlot locally here in, in Napa or in, or in California that I that I thought was comparable or that I could enjoy, right? And so I started working with this fruit, and initially I was using this to blend into Cabernet because it's another one of the Bordeaux blenders. And then at some point, I, I felt like I started getting the hang of it, and just the wine started tasting really delicious in the barrel. And I started thinking, I need to pull some of this and start bottling this on its own rather than blending it with uh, with Cabernet. 
And I'm really glad that I did because I, I see that the wine is, is just turning into something else. I mean, I'm really impressed with this Merlot. So there's plenty, plenty of aromas there. Still smells fresh like the, like the other wines. Again, with the color, no signs of uh, oxidation or aging. Still a pretty vibrant red, uh, dark red color. Pretty complex aromas. It, it just smells to me, the, the, the best word that I have to describe it, it smells like a classic fine wine to me. And what is that? It's hard for me to say. I mean, that's one of the things that, that, that I love about wine is that it's not always easy to describe what it is or how it smells or, you know, there might be uh, aromas and tastes that you're familiar with, but it's not always easy when the wine is really complex to, to put, put uh, a word, words to the way that it smells or that it tastes. And so, you know, those of us that are on the technical side of the things, we have an even smaller vocabulary than the professional wine tasters. You know, for us, is it, it's good, it's bad, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's flat, it's acid, it's, it's sweet, it's dry, and things like that, you know, so. A little bit more straightforward, but less poetic a lot of the times. And that's how you know when a winemaker is, uh, is really in love with the wine is when they start getting poetic about it, then you know that they really like it, as opposed to saying these really basic things that I just said. So anyway, let's taste it. Enough talk. And I think it's just fantastic. I mean, everything that I said about not liking Merlot's when I came back from Italy, I mean, this really convinced me again that we maybe should give Merlot a, a, another shot and maybe we work on the way that the Merlot is grown and, and produced. And uh, the reason I say that is because uh, initially, pretty much all the red varietals were all treated the same in terms of how they were growing the grapes and how the wine was being made in the, in the different wineries. And then people started realizing, well, Burgundy wine, Pinot Noir is much different than Bordeaux wine. And so we started making Pinot Noir differently than we were making Cabernet, right? But what happened is that Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Tiberio, they all got lumped into Cabernet Sauvignon. And it was treated like Cabernet Sauvignon. And nobody, few people respected the fact that Merlot has different characteristics and different requirements, not only in the vineyard, but also in the winery and in, in the way that you make the wine and it, and compared to Cabernet Sauvignon, it's, it's powerful, but delicate at the same time, which is kind of, kind of an odd thing. You know, it's, it's, it's got a, a pretty, uh, thick skin, chewy skin like Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's also difficult in, uh, getting rid of some of these pears. like, like, like I was saying earlier with the Cabernet Franc, it just kind of comes together. And, and in Merlot, you have to give it some hang time, but then you got to be careful because, Maybe it likes a little bit more water. So, you know, in our in our situation here in Napa, uh, further up valley where it's warm, you, you can start, you know, turning to raisins if you're not careful. So, you know, when you start turning to raisins, when the wine's not ripe, you start having, when the grapes are not ripe, you start having these uh, more um, tart wines with a lot of sugar, which turns into alcohol. So you end up having these uh, unbalanced wines that look like they're ripe because the sugar is there, but it's kind of, it's a concentrated effect. And so the, the acid get concentrated as well. And so when you put those two things together, you have this harshness in the wine with a harsh level of acidity combined with the, with the, with the alcohol just produces this harsh sensation when you taste it. And here in Carneros, even though it's, uh, it's kind of the, the outer limit for, for growing this, I think it does a really nice job of, of getting to the ripeness that at least I like for the wines. I mean, these are all 14.5 wines basically, which is pretty standard around here. Uh, and, and not having these signs of, of vegetal or, or lack of ripeness in the wine. So pretty delicious. All right, so let's go to the red wine. And I poured this into a Bordeaux, a burgundy shaped glass. This is a 2009. And this is one that... Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a fascinating wine. It requires quite a bit of time to let it breathe and, and to open up. So if, if you, buy, if you uh, order this wine, just know that when you first pour it out, this wine has been in bottle you know, for almost 10 years. It's going to take a little bit of time for it to, uh, to, to start uh, growing and, and showing what it has. You know, the, the, this is the one wine that when you first open it, it might have this older wine characteristic right when you smell it and keep in mind it's been under cork for this long it hasn't breathed as much as maybe some of these wines that are younger and so it just takes a little while longer and that's why i poured it in a, in a pinot glass because i wanted it to just kind of open up some more 
and, and get beyond uh, this aged wine character that you first pick up on the nose. And so if you open this and you, and you give it enough time and you have the, the conversation with it, it just starts blossoming into this beautiful expression of wine. And so uh, back in 2009, we weren't as clever with names, so the best we could do was call it Red Wine. And uh, the story of this wine is, uh, 2009 was the first year that, that we made wine with Mira. And uh, we had uh, Syrah and we had Cabernet Franc, the same Cabernet Franc that uh, we tasted earlier, right? Same vineyard. And we thought it would be fun to do a 50-50 blend of the two because they came from the same vineyard just to see what the, what the effect was. And uh, it's kind of crazy to blend Syrahs and Cabernet Francs because they're two completely different styles of, of wines, right? And, and uh, one is much more powerful and one is much more delicate. But we thought, you know, we're in the lab or actually it was in the cellar and I... I brought one of these uh, cylinder, graduated cylinders with me, you know, with the great Asian. I just put 50 milliliters of Syrah, 50 milliliters of Cabernet Franc, poured it in a glass. And we were shocked pleasantly at how good the wine tasted. Now, when it was young, it, 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 it would keep flopping back and forth between whether it tasted more like Syrah or it tasted more like Cab Franc. Then eventually it all, it all started coming together. And for the longest time, it was just this really it had almost a candy flavor to it, like a, you know, fruit candy with the acidity that it had a little bit of tartness, but a little bit of sweetness from the Syrah. And it was just this, this very impactful wine. And so, uh, you know, we offered it for sale for, for about a year and then it was, a, it, it was finished and we didn't look at it again until now, you know, I'm looking at the inventory and I'm thinking, you know, I'd really like to have, have a go at this red wine. Cause I think it's fascinating. It's from our first vintage. And it's uh, these two varietals that, 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 that we love and that we make uh, single bottlings of. And I'm really curious to see how it's aged because one of the things that, you know, you, you get asked a lot as a winemaker is that what is the aging potential of the different wines? And so something that's, uh, that's kind of uh, alternating type characteristics or, or contrasting characteristics of wine with the Syrah and with the Cap Franc and you think, you know, Cap Francs should be able to last for a long time, but Syrahs we're not so sure and stuff like that. I was curious to see how well it had actually aged, you know, in the in the ten years that it's been in bottle. And I, as I said earlier, I was shocked at how good it is. You know, it, you give it some time. You know, you have to understand that if, if you get uh, a case of this, that uh, the no two bottles are going to be exactly the same. You know, the, the 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 bottle is another aging vessel, much like the barrels, and so. You know, as, as the wine ages in barrels and you have different barrels that you're aging it in from different producers, from different forests, different toasts, different ages, you know, the wine that was aged in this barrel might taste a little bit different from this barrel, even though it's the same juice, let's say, right? Well, the same thing happens in bottles because they, even though we have the same specification of cork, uh, there's going to be different amounts of micro oxygenation act, acting upon the wine that's in that bottle. So... Some wines, they might be more flamboyant from the get-go and just really reveal what they got. Some wines, you know, some bottles might be requiring just a little bit more patience when you first open them to let them really express what they are. And so that's one of the things to look out for when you open this wine. You know, if you, if you get one of those bottles that just seems kind of, you know, it, it's kind of, it smells old, just give it a little bit of a chance and let it open up and, and, and it'll show you what's really beautiful that's lying underneath. And I just think this one, it, it just smells so classic. You know, it's, it's hard to, to identify either one of the varietals. And it's just, it, it's, a, it's truly a red wine, a 50-50 blend of Syrah and Cap Franc, but it just smells like a classic, delicious red wine. And it, it is just delicious. It still has plenty of acidity. It's got some freshness. It's got structure. Um, the nose is, is a little bit different than the taste, but there's plenty of texture on the taste too, which really surprises me. You know, it's still fleshy. It's long lasting. Um, just a really impressive old wine for us anyway, to, to, to taste and enjoy. And so what, about a week ago, 10 days ago, when I did the same tasting with, with my team here, and one was my assistant winemaker, and uh, 
Another one is uh, our ho- director of hospitality. We're tasting through these wines and trying to come to a consensus of which ones we wanted to show people. We all fell in love with this red wine. It was just such a difference from everything else that we tasted. You know, all of the wines were delicious, but this one was just kind of in, in, in its own world, just a completely different profile from what we were tasting with the other wines. So hopefully uh, you get a chance to taste it. And uh, of course, I made a mess. A, a tasting with me wouldn't be complete if there wasn't a little bit of mess. So that's what that's about. And now uh, let's say, let's see if we got any questions. So the first question from John. Hi, John. Hi again. Can you talk about reductive winemaking? What tells what tells would give 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 away reduction to the taster of the wine? Okay, so that's a really good question, John. And can you talk about which red wines in the mirror portfolio you would decant and for how long to decant? Okay, those are really good questions, John, because for me, as, as a winemaker, there's two different types of reduction. And so one type of reduction, and, and, and they're, they're kind of related, but to me, there's they're two different characteristics. And so one, when we talk about reduction, it's, it's in the chemical sense and the scientific sense that we're looking to avoid any kind of aeration. Right. So what ends up happening is because the wine is not exposed to air, uh, it basically starts closing in on itself. And it's really difficult or or it takes a little bit of time for it to release what's in that wine. And so the reductive winemaking that I do for that, most of my wine is actually pretty reductive because I I don't like to aerate the wines because I feel that uh, avoiding aeration as much as possible in the winemaking process with certain varietals, of course, and you know, not, not avoiding aeration completely, it allows the wine to retain many more of its nuances over the course of aging. And so when I make the wine, I limit the exposure to air uh, during the process. So, you know, during fermentation, when there's a lot of carbon dioxide being produced and, and I know the yeast is going to be happier if it's getting some air, I'll, I'll, I'll use, you know, techniques to, to bring air into the wine and to aerate the wine so that the yeast is happening and it continues to to do what it's supposed to do, to continue doing its job of fermenting and reproducing so that I can finish my fermentation. But once all that starts going away and the CO2 starts blowing off and stuff like that, and we go to the barrel stage, I really try to minimize how much I move the wine once it's in barrel so that I, I minimize how much it gets exposed to air. And so what ends up happening in this case is, uh, the wines go into this reduced stage. And I like that for during the course of aging. But what, what ends up happening is if I took you into the cellar and we tasted the wine from 2017, which we still have, you know, we, we ate some of the wines for a long time. And I pour you some in your glass, the, your first instinct would be, well, you know, this doesn't really smell like anything. This has no taste, has no flavor, right? And it's a, a little bit different than the effect that the red wine has, right, that I was talking about. You got to give it some time. In this case, you know, you, you give it a little bit of time and you start swirling the glass and stuff. And then it, all the aromas and the flavors start coming out and you start really seeing what's there. Whereas originally it was just kind of mute, right? It's like hitting the, the mute button on your stereo. There's, there's no sound, there's something there, but there's no sound. And then the minute you unmute it, all of a sudden there's all the sound again and, and these different characteristics of the music that you're listening to. That's kind of the, reduct, the reductive winemaking that I like to do. But on the other hand, there's another kind of reduction that's more of a flaw in wines. But sometimes it's a positive flaw, right? So sometimes these things that that, uh, seem, that are funky end up giving the wine character. And I can talk about that specifically for the Syrah. So some of these varietals, uh, when they start going into this reductive phase in, in the barrels, you know, keep in mind that you have uh, solids still that are settling out at the bottom of the barrel when it's young, right? So some, we call that lees. The lees that settles at the bottom of the barrel sometimes, when that goes into reduction, it really compacts at the bottom. And so there's no air there. And what ends up happening is it starts giving off these kind of skunky, funky aromas. And so the way to deal with that is, is you break it up, right? You go in there with your, with your uh, stir rod and you, you break it up and you shake it up and, you, and it goes into suspension and the sinkiness will go away. But if you're trying to... Uh, clean your wine and settle it so you don't have to filter it later. You have to take the wine out before those aromas get transposed into the wine because there's an exchange going on there and you can get that skunkiness into the wine. Some people, that's their style. You know, when you smell it and there's a skunkiness and a funkiness and maybe when you first open the bottle, you get that and then it blows off. That's another type of reduction. And a lot of times 
for a lot of winemakers, it's a flaw. For me, in the case of uh, Syrah, it's kind of what I look for before I decide to rack the wine. And rack is taking the wine out at some point during its barrel aging, taking it off the leaves and then putting it back, putting the wine back in once I've cleaned the barrel to, to complete its aging. When I get a little bit of that character in the nose and it transfers into the wine, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So to sum, sum up uh, the two reductions, there's the chemical uh, chemistry form of reduction, which is basically a lack of oxygen that uh, basically inhibits the characteristics of the wine from showing themselves. And then there's this reduction that you get also caused from this lack of, of oxygen, but that, that causes this kind of skunky, funky character in the wine that gets passed onto the wine if you leave it on there for too long. And there are ways to take that out, you know, that uh, I try to avoid doing that too as much as possible. So really careful to not get that funkiness in, in the varietals that I don't want the funkiness in. And in the Syrah, like I said, I like a little bit of that in there. And it's kind of the clue for me that I need to move the wine off the leaves and then uh, empty out, the, clean out the barrels and put the wine back in. So hopefully that was a clear answer. It was a long answer, but it's uh, it's kind of like the, the, the real technical uh, side of uh of reduction for winemakers. All right, so let's, uh, okay, so the second part of your question, John, was which red wines in the mirror portfolio would you decant and, and for how long to decant? So that's a really good question. Um, I'm not a, a big fan of decanting. Uh, I like to, uh, and I know sometimes we're in a hurry to drink the wines and, you know, when I do a tasting, when the wines are really young, uh, I don't decant necessarily to take the wines off uh, any sediment, and that's where this thingamabobber, doohickey, as some people call it, comes in. Um, I don't I don't decant for that purpose, but sometimes I need to decant for the wine to taste the way it's supposed to, right? And this goes back to your question about reduction. You know, if it's been in the bottle uh, for a little bit, or if the wine is really young and kind of uh, aggressive, and I want the wine to taste right, if I'm doing a tasting where there's going to be a bunch of people that, that they're just going to show up, you pour wine in the glass and they taste it and I want the wine to taste right, I'll decant that uh, into a decanter and then back into the bottle to pour from the bottle for those people. But other than that, for the most part, I, I'm not a, a big fan of decanting the wine. I like to uh, kind of let the wine open up on its own in, in the glass. And over time, you know, sometimes it, it, it's hard to, to do that because the wine tastes so good the way it is and you just want to drink it, which happens a lot in my house. But um for the most part, I, I, I don't really like to decant wine. So w when people ask me that in regards to the, the mirror wines, I would say, you know, when the wines are young, when they first come out, uh, the, the wines have a tendency to improve a lot with bottle age, right? So this is kind of the opposite of maybe what a lot of people would say, that you decant an older wine. I would say that decant the younger wines to allow them to open up sooner in the glass. And then as the wines age, you don't need to decant them as much. So, you know, we, we had a... Uh, a scenario even with the white wines where we were decanting Chardonnays when they were young just to really get them to taste and to pop in the glass. So even our uh, our Napa Valley version of the Chardonnay with a little bit of aeration when it's young just gives you this much more opulent Chardonnay that's just really interesting to see the, the difference and you wouldn't think in a young wine that decanting would make that much of a difference. So that's basically for me that's what I do. I, I don't uh, necessarily recommend decanting just because I think if you can take the time with the glass to see how it changes over time as you're sipping different different uh, portions of the bottle, you know, as you go through this first little bit that you first pour when you first pop the cork is going to be different than this middle part that's going to be different than this bottom part, you know, assuming that you take a little bit of time drinking the wine. And that's one of the things that I find fascinating about wine is that it's changing even as you're drinking it, right? So whereas you're, if you decan it, it's just going to speed up the process and maybe you'll get to this part much sooner than you than than than, than you would if you had not decanted it. So hopefully that helps. So let's see. The next question is uh, from Stacy. I'm understanding that Merlot can stand on its own and not just be used in making a red blend or a Cabernet Sauvignon. But what foods pair well with a great Mira Merlot? Well, that's a pretty good question, uh, Stacy. And uh, let's go back to the Merlot. And I would say. On this specific Merlot, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the uh, the structure or uh, or the uh, tannins. Same thing as as a Cabernet or even a Syrah for for a really aggressive piece of meat. So I would I would recommend this more for 
things that, that have uh, like a tomato based sauce, like a spaghetti with uh, some kind of tomato sauce, um, maybe a, a less fatty meat, you know, a less fatty cut, like a, uh, you know, like a sirloin or something like that, a filet mignon, things that, that are a little bit more lean for this wine than, than, than maybe compared to uh, like a, you know, what I would choose for a Cabernet. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong with with meats or with uh, charcuterie and things like that with this with this specific wine. So somewhere in that ballpark, I mean, when when, when I'm looking at this wine now and I'm thinking in my head, what would I love to have with this right now? I'm thinking like a puttanesca spaghetti, and maybe it's because I'm hungry now. But uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind with me: something that involves some kind of tomato sauce or tomatoes, uh, with with be it a spaghetti or or with some kind of meat cut or 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 something like that. So hopefully, you know, we, we'd love to have suggestions on what you think as well. Um, when you try the wines, what you pair them with and if it worked out or not, I, I would love to hear about that too. So let me see if I have any more questions. And it looks like that was the last one. And um, I still have wine in my glass, but I'm, you know, once the lights go off, who knows what's going to happen. But uh, I thank you for joining me for this. And I look forward to doing many more of these in the future and, and maybe uh, getting the chance to focus more on, on a single wine later on and, and going more, diving a little bit deeper into the, uh, one specific wine and talking more about that. So in the meantime, uh, I would ask for your homework assignment is to think of questions that you can ask me when we do these because I do love to answer the questions and I love to uh, talk about what makes uh, these mirror wines what they are. So. And being the one that makes the wines, I hope that I have the right answers to all those. But anyway, I thank you for uh, participating today. I hope you have a lovely rest of your Thursday. And as we look forward to the weekend, I hope you have a great weekend as well. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity for you to visit us here in the very near future. Thank you so much and have a great evening.